What do you do? I play the orchestra. Hello and welcome to episode 88 of Popcorn and Prosecco, a show that's all about talking about movies. I am Perry Nemiroff and here are my co-hosts, Christy Puchko and Angie Han. Hello. Hey, everybody. So this week we've got two for you. We are going to do full reviews of Room and Steve Jobs. And first up is Room, and I am taking that one. Here is the IMDb synopsis. After five-year-old Jack and his ma escape from the enclosed surroundings that Jack has known his entire life, the boy makes a thrilling discovery, the outside world. That is a bad one. That's a bad one. I don't so, think so. No, that Go is a, not inaccurate. That's, no one would read that and like get what this movie is about. So Jack that's and true. Ma are confined. We meet them confined to this room, and it's basically the size of a garden shed because that's what it is. And it's Jack's whole world. She had him in that room, so that's the whole world that he knows. And they're being held captive by a man who abducted her at some point. That's that's not a spoiler. That's part of the story. No, yeah, that's so. Yeah. So they're stuck in this room, and it's all about, you know, you've seen it in the trailer. And actually, you know what? If you haven't watched the trailer, I'd recommend not watching the trailer. Because the trailer is essentially a summary of this movie. But that's besides the point. I thought this was, like, an absolutely incredible, almost perfect adaptation of the book. I'm obsessed with the book, and this thing just comes to screen not exactly the way I pictured it. Actually, you know... Pretty close to the way I pictured it while I was reading the book, down to like all the little details in the room. But it's one of those things where if you've read the book, seeing it come to life enriches what you read in the book. And I assume it's going to be vice versa. If you see the movie and then read the book, there's so many more details that'll make you appreciate the movie that much more. That's interesting. So what about the book did you like so much that you feel translates well to the movie? Particularly the connection to the two characters. It's like when I... When I got to the end, the, the book ends a little abruptly. And when I got to the end, it was one of those experiences where I was like, like, I went through like a room withdrawal because I was so attached to those characters and I wanted to stay with them. And I thought it was the same thing here. I just absolutely fell in love with these two people. And I told, I mean, the chemistry between Brie Larson and uh, Jacob Tremblay is just absolutely incredible. And I loved the way that they that they narrowed down the supporting characters. In the book, there's like, I want to say like four or five more really important supporting characters that they completely strip away. And they essentially give that screen time to the grandmother and, well, or the mother, whatever, uh, Brie Larson's character's mother and her boyfriend, Leo. And I thought that that was probably one of the smartest moves. The only thing that I slightly take issue with in this movie is that I wish William H. Macy's character had just like a little more to him. He was just so mm-hmm. in it's and out that I don't... It's a cameo. It, it is a cameo. I'm, and I mean, that role, he plays uh, Brie Larson's character's father. Her name in the movie is Joy. They don't name her in the book, but in the movie they they outright say she is Joy. And... He plays Joy's father, and he he has some issues with what happens when he he can't just be happy that they have escaped. There's there's another family issue in there, and mm-hmm. I thought that it deserved a little more time than it got. That's interesting. So I haven't read the book. Um, I was actually really nervous to watch this movie because I saw the trailer a few months ago when everyone was freaking out about it, and I was like... <gasps> Oh, God, that's going to be hard to watch because it just looked horrible. It looked like, you know, like it looked like, okay, it looked like the stuff on Investigation Discovery where it's like a 17 year old girl is abducted by a man and then raped for like years. And in it, she has a baby. And I was like, this all sounds terrible and upsetting. That but is what the movie is about. No, and that is the plot. But what like I find incredible. That is that the film doesn't treat it that way. The film doesn't treat it with that level of like, oh my God. Like it's not seedy. It's not uh, exploitative. And it's actually, because it is from Jack's perspective, um, the terrible things that we know happen to Joy are all left to our imagination and left off screen, which I thought was actually a really smart move because It allows us to function with Joy as his mother understands him, but slightly deeper. You know, like, I mean, I hate that we have to say it in this day and age, but just because there is a sexual assault in a story, I don't need to see it. And I think that Room handles that really well. I mean, if anything, it works better that you don't see the sexual assault because it's from Jack's perspective. And he's a kid that hasn't spent his whole, like, he has no idea what's going on. He just knows it's bad and scary. So you are kind of in his mindset. I mean, if anything, we've watched so many movies with, like, rape scenes and, like, so many movies with violence. Violence, and you you just kind of become a little bit numb to it, but 
watching it from the perspective of this very small child, it becomes so much more, it becomes really horrifying all over again. It's also really nice that the movie isn't so much about them escaping. It's about them escaping to a point, but it's not like they're stuck here. They need to figure it out. Like their plan is ruined. Then they cut, you know, like that typical trajectory where like the ending is them coming out and like hugging family and all that shit. It's much more so about them getting out, but also about what that whole experience does to them and how it changes their lives and how it kind of like detaches them from like societal norms now. Well, I feel like we're getting a little bit into spoiler stuff. Do we want to move into spoilers? It's it's almost tough to tell what spoilers are in this because the, the trailer, trailer gives, gives away so much. everything yeah. away. Before we go into any spoilers, can we talk a little bit about the performances, particularly Jacob yeah. Tremblay, who plays the little boy? Like, I, I read the book, but it was a few years ago, so when I saw the trailer, even I didn't realize how much of this book, how much of the story rests on his shoulders. It's like, he's the main character. It's not Brie Larson. Mm -hmm. Uh, He's the guy, he's the character that's in almost every single scene in the movie. And it's not a movie that would have worked at all if you had just like a kid, like a kid actor who was not, not that good. And kid actors are hit or miss. They don't have years of training, but this kid was fantastic. I thought. Yeah. I was actually really impressed. It's kind of weird how good he is. I don't know. Like I can't like wrap my head around like a five-year-old kid doing what he did so naturally. And I got a little obsessed. If you go on the A24 YouTube page, they have these little behind the scenes featurettes. And I was just like fascinated by watching like what the atmosphere was like on set. And I'm sure for those, things they only shot like the happier moments and included those but like I was just watching how like him and Brie Larson interacted when the camera wasn't rolling it's just like you really have to have like all hands on deck and like the perfect environment and and they they just really nailed it and he it's just so he I bet you anything he's gonna get the nomination yeah well I think both of them will Apparently they they're, they're submitting him as best supporting actor, which is making some people mad. Are they because really? He's not a supporting actor. He's no, the he's not. Lead he's actor. Not. Or that's what that's I've heard. Surprising. Anyway. I mean, I think he has a better shot of supporting just because of the politics of that kind of stuff. But I think that is also just shady awards oh, and politicking. I don't. But I want to say so. something about his performance. What I think is really interesting for those people who haven't seen the film, um, it. I feel like a lot of times child performances when they're leading a film go to one of two ways. They go the way of precocious where, uh, you know, it's just like, gee, aren't I adorable? Or it goes the way of like a uh, cool shove effect, which is basically like it shows a child staring off into the distance. And because of what they intercut, it seems all wistful and meaningful. And it's really just a very like, you know, appealing looking child, a cute looking child who is given a sense of grandiosity by the editing and by the music and all that kind of stuff. I don't think Room does that. I'm really impressed because in the beginning when the kid is in, when Jack is in Room, he seems like any kid you'd see at a playground. He's outgoing, he's excited, he's happy. But then as he starts realizing the world, as he realizes it isn't it isn't what he has been taught, which is that the entire world is Room. Um, you really see him start to shut down and start to have to process these things. And it's incredible to watch. And like, I I was very impressed because I was moved by the movie, but not like emotionally destroyed by the movie. And I feel like that's smart. I feel like that was the intention. I think that like we talked about how they didn't want to show the, they didn't show the rape scene. I think the filmmaker of this, who is the same guy who did Frank, right? Lenny Abramson. Lenny Abramson. He did Frank and What Richard Did. What Richard Did is actually, it's a little bit, it's it's another movie about a terrible event that doesn't just sensationalize it. So I, I think that uh, he was a good choice for this movie. I think he didn't want us to shut down emotionally and just be like, like basically like short circuit and be like, this is too much and I can't. And then you disconnect from the movie just because you need to kind of preserve your emotional sanity. Um, and so this movie never pushes it to that point where you want to shut down. And so instead, I always felt locked in with Jack and locked in with Ma. And there are like little things that Jack say that are so devastating because you as an adult realize what he does not about what he's saying. But the film never beat you over the head with grief or anything. And and that was something in my, my review for Pajiba that I really wanted to point out to people because a lot of our readers were very concerned that this was effectively going to be emotional pornography. And it's not. It's actually a much more restrained, much more thoughtful, and therefore much more powerful movie. Lenny Abramson also deserves a lot of credit for how he shot uh, Jacob Tremblay's performance because the whole book is basically narrated by by the kid. And 
I was really concerned about that coming across clearly in the movie. And the movie is not entirely narrated. There is some narration from him. But it's also, like, the main reason I think we, we find that this movie is his movie rather than Brie Larson's movie is because of how, how he shoots him and during the edit when they cut to him. Like, there's so many scenes where... Like, you think that the camera would be on Brie Larson, like, emoting in a big scene. Like, like I just picture the one scene they released online, too, because I was busy inspecting it the other day with uh, Brie Larson, Joan Allen, and Jacob Tremblay. And the the mothers are arguing, and he's just sitting there playing. And it's, like, the time that they cut to him, it's, like, you could see him processing what's happening. Mm-hmm. And that makes their fight so much more important. And it, and it keeps you in his perspective, which I love. I absolutely love this movie. I can't recommend it enough. I'm dying to see it again and again. And at this point, this is what I'm going to be rooting for most more than anything out there right now for award season. I don't think I loved it quite as much as you did, but it is, it's a really good movie and a lot less depressing uh, and more, I don't want to say uplifting, but it's not like a feel good movie. But it's a movie that has a lot of heart. I think I said what I had to say. I don't know. I think it's a very good movie. I think it's uh, going to be an interesting choice at the Oscars, though I worry because it's not about a white dude. But this one is, so it's already in the <laughs> Oscar conversation. All right. I'm going to, I'm just going to, I, sus- I, I deeply I don't suspected think that's, Christy wasn't going to like this one, but let's barrel did, into it I also don't anyway. think that's the only reason it's in the Oscar conversation right now. Everything about this movie just screams Oscar, but like oh not, the, qual- not guys, the quality of the movie. You guys, shut up. I need to get to the synopsis. All right. Set backstage at three iconic product launches and ending in 1998 with the unveiling of the IMAX, Steve Jobs takes us behind the scenes of the digital re- revolution to paint a portrait of the man at its epicenter i did not expect to like this movie very much at all uh or okay actually the more accurate way of putting it is i was i expected to enjoy this movie while i was watching it but i was not looking forward to watching it because i feel like uh so many so many um biopics especially ones about as you guys pointed out, white guys are just kind of just like, you know, he was kind of a dick, but then he uh, invented the IMAX. So, and like Aaron Sorkin is especially kind of bad with that. So I went in and <laughs> I have to say I was, it does kind of veer into that toward the third act, but I have to say in the first two acts, I fucking love this movie. Like if the, if wow, the third really? act were as good as the first two acts, it would be one of my favorite movies of the year. So wow. imagine my surprise. I did not expect to, I did no, not that's, expect to happen at all. So that's interesting. I was supposed to see this for New York Film Festival, but I couldn't get my shit together to get to the screening. So Perry and I actually went earlier this week together, and I was so glad we did because we had a similar <laughs> reaction. But this is this is the thing. It is – the performance in this, this movie are outstanding. I think Michael Fassbender really – brings on a side of Steve Jobs that made sense to me. I think Seth Rogen is killer as Steve Wozniak. I think uh, Kate Winslet is going to be up again for Best Actress, probably supporting, because like you don't even recognize her for like the first half hour of the movie. Uh, but, but I think that's all very good. My problem is it doesn't feel like a fucking movie. It feels like a play. Like it feels like Private Lives or something where they literally repeat the same three things. Like the product launch, it's like, okay, we're 10 minutes away. Let's have super long conversations about your daughter and all the aggressions and resentments we have towards each other with these characters. And it's like, no matter what is going on in his life, the same fucking four people keep showing up and being like, Steve, how have you changed as a person in the last several years? And I just thought (laughs) it's so, it's like, it thinks it's so clever. And I'm like, if this were a Broadway show, I'd probably be super into it but because it's a movie it just really drove me nuts because it feels like an Aaron Sorkin script more than it feels like a Danny Boyle movie and that well, bummed me out true. because between the two things I would rather watch a Danny Boyle movie than listen to an Aaron Sorkin script because like I feel like at this point I could fucking write an Aaron Sorkin script based on just he's becoming kind of a character of himself at this point where it's like just more and more like I used to love the West Wing and like I loved it newsroom I couldn't get into for various reasons but like this is almost like if you had like a bingo card of Aaron Sorkin checkpoints like you're just like bingo in like 10 seconds because it's like (laughs) is there a woman who cries while doing her job check is there a white guy explaining to me aggressively and relentlessly about why he's right about things and I'm wrong check is there a dick who we all have to act as if he's the greatest thing ever even though he's a dick because he did something exceptional okay that's the part that I want to talk about because the thing I loved about the first two acts and the thing that really surprised me is how much this is a movie about Steve Jobs as just a human like not you know, because I feel like you know, with a lot of biopics, including you know Aaron Sor- including a lot of like Aaron Sorkin movies and stuff, you know, you, you're just you're like, oh, this is about like the the man that made the iPhone or whatever. But to me, this felt so much, especially in the first two acts, about just 
a man. Like it felt like it's a movie about it's a movie about him. And the the big emotional th- uh, through line in this movie is his relationship with these people, specifically, particularly his uh, daughter, who he initially doesn't even want to acknowledge as his, doesn't want to support at all in any way, not even financially. And then, you know, you kind of see their relationship progress. And then his, like, weird, like, daddy issues relationship with Jeff Daniels. Um, And to me, it just felt so much like, we know who Steve Jobs is in our culture. We know who he is as an icon. And I like this movie because it was just an intimate look at this person who is you know, for all the other shit that's going on, he's just a, a fucked up dude. And the movie in the first two acts did not feel like it was to me saying like, you know, oh, but we should forgive him. We should excuse him. We should still admire him. It just is just like, no, this is just a movie about a guy that's a, about a dude. He's he's sad. He's, you know, he's got a lot of problems. There's some good things about him, too. He's like, he can be charismatic. He can be really smart. And that that was what I loved about it. And then that's why the third act didn't really work for me. I think I do get what you mean about it being theatrical, a little bit repetitive. And that really started to get to me in the third act where I was just, where I don't, I, I feel like they, I feel like Boyle and Sorkin felt the pressure to kind of tie everything up in a nice bow. So they had to bring back things that didn't really make sense to, uh, for them to come back. Like, for example, a, a few of the characters that are still in his life at the, in the third act, you're just kind of like, why? I mean, I yeah. get thematically why, but like, you know, in a, like, in a more, like, when you think about it logically, you're just like, why are these people he stopped working with, like, 20, or I guess, like, 10 years ago? And who ago? he treats like garbage. Like, why, like, why are they still here? And then they, they try to fix that by having some, like, you know, kind of off, like, they have, like, uh, one of his friends, like, making an reference to like oh well we've been friends our entire lives and I'm like oh okay but you know we've only seen you in these in these two other scenes where all you've done is get yelled at by Steve Jobs so I don't really get it and then it also starts to kind of be like well we have to like give it a little bit of a happy ending so then it starts to like do that thing where they're like uh, and then, and then, well, that's the, the that's IMAX. the problem with this format. It's the same things over and over. And like, while I don't think that they ever could have, you know, started from the beginning of the story and gone to the end with all the filler in between, you kind of need that filler in order to appreciate all of the things that happened during the IMAC launch. But I want to go back to something you said before about this just being the story of a man. I actually had the exact opposite reaction. Like, I felt like I was watching the freaking Steve Jobs show. Like, I don't know, I'd, I didn't see any of those, like, vulnerabilities or human qualities or him. I, I just, like, didn't see him caring about anyone around him ever, except maybe towards the end when they, like, need to put, like, a pretty little bow on top of the movie so you don't walk away with too bad of a taste in your mouth. But my biggest problem with this movie is, and, and like, maybe this is just an issue with me personally, but I'm, like, obsessed with my Apple products, and seeing this version of Steve Jobs kind of, like, upset me. Did you not know it, he was an asshole? I, he was no, famously I, an asshole. I, I knew he was an asshole. And I think I think Christy might have said this when we walked out. I knew he was an asshole, but this movie felt like he was being an asshole to me for two hours. <laughs> Like it's Maybe like he was just I looking. Like I want that on a poster. I did it's not like... feel like personally victimized by the movie because I was enjoying it. Also, if you're if you should be mad at anyone for that part, it's Aaron Sorkin. Yeah. But really, I mean, I do kind of feel personally victimized as like a diehard Apple product fan, and I'm like obsessing over these creations that this this man like stomped all over these poor other people to make happen. It's like. I mean, like, I don't want Apple products to go away, but, like, is it right that he did? I don't know. I was so obsessed with that that I couldn't appreciate anything about, like, the story I was experiencing at all. I mean, okay, but if you're going to bring that up, like, then you have to get into, like, I mean, you know Apple products are, crea- are like, the product yeah. of a lot of human mm-hmm. rights violations and stuff. Like, a guy yelling at his employees no, totally. is really the least of the sins yeah, that I've right, gotten that's... to my iPhone. No, that's No, and fair. I get that, but, I, like, I also felt the same way Perry did, where it's like, it's like when an artist you like does something shitty on social media, and then you're mm-hmm. like, like, for instance, Jeremy Renner's been shooting his mouth off about all things. <laughs> and like last night, Hansel and Gretel Witch Hunters was on sci fi. And Zach's like, oh, look, this movie you love. And I was like, I don't want to watch it right now. And it's not like it's ruined the movie for me, but it has tainted it for me a little bit. And like, that's how I felt watching Steve Jobs when I like pull out my iPhone. And I was like, this doesn't mean it's OK that you were mean to your daughter. Like. And that's the thing. At the end of the movie, it seems like all he has to do to redeem himself is do the least bit of kindness to his daughter. No, and I found it's that true. so insulting. It's a huge problem that I had with the ending and why I felt like the ending was such a letdown. Like, I was like, I'm so, like, this is still an interesting, enjoyable movie. I'm still enjoying the performances and the dialogue and whatnot. 
but it did feel like it, it was like, well, we have to end with with um, a redemption arc, so uh, let's just throw this in. And it felt like it came out of nowhere. I also do wonder if maybe my ideas of Steve Jobs as a person were different from you guys is going in because the thing is, I always thought this guy's horrible, and in and like the fact that he made all these good things, like you know. Like, yeah, I, mean, I, I like his things, but like he's like always been a stuff. horrible person. And I've always just kind of hated the cult around him where people act like, oh, yeah, he was, you know, he was a complete asshole. But then we own iPhones now, so it's OK. So yeah. the, what that was one of the things that surprised me about this movie. I don't think the movie necessarily likes him or wants us to like him, especially in the first two acts. The third act is a little bit. Mm. Um, but I do think it kind of wants us. I think it's just a movie that asks us to emphasize with a screwed up person as just a fellow person. Well, I did, and I think this movie—I think that this story or this version of his story should have been told from somebody else's perspective. Like, I kind of wish that it was Kate Winslet's movie, and I mm. could have seen her her version of what it was like to put on all these launches and what it was yeah, like dealing with him. I would have liked a window to why people put up with him because I don't feel like this movie explained that to me. I do. I mean, I would have liked to do that a little bit more. Like, too, I yeah. get that he's a visionary, but I, so like I understood why people put up with him business wise. I didn't understand why people engage with him on a personal level, even the Kate Winslet character. Because just quickly before we wrap, uh, you know, because like most of the movie, I understood their relationship, and then in the third fucking act, there's a scene where he goes, "How come we've never slept together?" And I was, just, I wanted to walk out. I was just like, that "Really?" Was the, the thing that made me mad was when she was like. She was like, I've been like, it's been eating it away at me for 19 years. And I was like, oh, has it? Oh, okay. Why are you still here then? Like this because the women. primary jokes about sleeping with her. I just kind of, you know, whatever. That was the least of my problems with that character. Yeah. I just, it, it, it goes to, like I said, the worst auspices of Sorkinism. And I, I just kind of, I know it's going to be an Oscar contender for, for performance and writing. Uh, and that kind of bums me out for the writing part because it's just, it's not, it's not revolutionary or interesting. It is literally what I expected of an Aaron Sorkin script about Steve Jobs. It is completely predictable. Yeah, I, I don't know if I can recommend seeing this just because of like how upset I kind of was. It made me out agitated. Of it. Like I was in a me, bad mood. It made me agitated and it made me kind of feel bad about some of the things that I love. But I think it's well worth seeing just for the performances alone, especially if you want to, you know, be up to date with your Oscar movies. I, in case you guys couldn't tell, mostly loved it and think that people should see it. Uh, it, it is very Aaron Sorkin-y, so if, if his, like, if his, you know, like, too clever by half dialogue gets on your nerves, this is not the movie for you. And, like, and, and, and I say that as, as someone who, sometimes I like him and sometimes I don't. Like, the social network I thought was um, overrated. Don't tell the internet. Yeah, I um, agree with that. <laughs> you just did. <laughs> Uh, Shh, but internet, yeah, this overall, is our secret. Overall, I think this is a good movie, and if nothing else, like you know, Perry's right. You should watch it for the performances. Alrighty, so that is a wrap on episode eighty-eight of Popcorn and Prosecco. You know the deal. Go to iTunes and please subscribe to us there. Rate and comment. We have our website, popcornprosecco.com. We are on Twitter at Popcorn Prosecco. Please like us on Facebook, and all three of us are all over the internet as well. Angie, you want to go first? Yes. Uh, I am on Twitter at AJHAN, and you can find my writing at SlashFilm.com. Christy? I'm on Twitter at Christy Puchko. That's K-R-I-S-T-Y-P-U-C-H-K-O, and I write all over the interwebs, including this week I'm on IndieWire and Billboard, so check those out. Um, but you can find my career highlights at DecadentCriminals.com. And you can catch my work at Collider.com, and my Twitter handle is at PNemeroff. So thank you guys so much for listening, and we'll see you next week. One evening when the sun went down.